Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Beyond the Frame. My name is Dottie San Martin. I'll be your host today. Well, you know, what a great time it is to be in the bowling industry. COVID really took a toll on so many different aspects of our lives, especially bowling centers that had to close for many, many months. But things are really starting to look up in the bowling world. Centers are reporting record highs. They're reporting that they've seen faces that they've never seen before. Competitive play is going through the roof. And we're getting some really great exposure in the media. We've got commercials. I saw just the other day a, a drug that had a commercial with bowling in it. Uh, and of course, the Mick Ultra Super Bowl commercial viewed by 101 million people, and it focused on bowling. I mean, that is truly a home run for this industry. Uh, and now we have a primetime sitcom, How We Roll, that premiered last Thursday night at 9.30 Eastern time, based on a true story of a young man played by Pete Holmes that took an unfortunate situation of being laid off as a car assembly line worker and turned it into the opportunity to pursue his dreams of becoming a professional bowler. Today, we have the privilege of having three-time PBA Tour winner, Tom Smallwood, the real Tom Smallwood, uh, with us on the show today. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. So to catch you guys up, uh, if you haven't seen How We Roll, uh, it's a true story based on Tom pursuing his dream of becoming a professional bowler. Uh, and it was turned into a primetime sitcom uh, and it's absolutely hilarious. Um, and so today we're gonna just talk a little bit about this. Tom, I have to ask, um, what was it like watching, watching the show last week? I'm assuming that you watched the show last week, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna roast it. Um, I had the opportunity to watch it um, a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, and my whole family flew to Vegas. I was there bowling for the Masters, and uh -huh. uh, I decided not to not to watch it until it you know it aired. So, yeah, I was surprised everybody else. Um, it's surreal. Um, you watch it, and it's a, you know it's a good sitcom, and then they use my name. It's it just it don't it to me. It still you know has a hit. Yeah, me yeah. It's like oh my gosh, that that's me. They're talking about there. That yeah, had to be crazy. And so you were able to watch it with all of your family. How cool is that? Yeah, that was great. They flew out and uh, made a day of it. So since we're talking to the real Tom Smallwood today, tell me something that most about you that most people would never in a million years know. Oh, I don't know. There's, I'm, I'm kind of an open book, but I'm really quiet. I'm shy. I don't say a whole lot to anybody. Um, I'm kind of a homebody when I'm home. I love spending time with okay. my kids. Uh, spent a ton of time in the woods, uh, in the outdoors. Okay. So yeah, that's, I mean, there really isn't a lot, a lot of stuff that, I mean, I, when people ask me, I tell you the truth pretty much all the time. I have no issue with that, but uh, I'm really reserved. I don't say a whole lot. And uh, okay. I, okay. Well, and I, and, you know, I'm sure when they cast your role, um, the, the two personalities, you know, you're talking comedian and, and, uh, and the real Tom over here. So were you, uh, that's, that's a little out of character for you, the real you, correct? Yeah, a little bit. Also, he's like six foot four and I'm like five <laughs> foot six. So, <laughs> uh, but no, um, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's so funny and uh, he's doing he a great is. job. So uh, yeah, uh, it's, you know, obviously they're, they're casting people to, for entertainment. They're not casting people to, to match my yeah. personality the way I act. So. Um, you know, it's a sitcom. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be entertaining. Um, you know, I mean, it's not going to be hundred percent truth. Just not. Yes. It, it wouldn't be that much fun. It wouldn't be that funny if it was. It's so, you know, there, there's truth in every episode and uh, I hope people enjoy it. Absolutely. Well, I know I watched it last week and, and I thought it was just uh, amazing. So I hope we've been trying to get people to support the show. I think that it's just, it's a great opportunity for Bowling to be uh, in prime time. And it's really cool that you get to share your journey of becoming a PBA bowler. Um, so how did this show come to be? How did your life suddenly turn into a sitcom? Oh, it, man, it, that happened like back in 09 uh, when I won. Um, you know, the world championship, it was just, you know, I ended up winning. Oh, man, that happened 
happened like back in 09. Uh huh. And so I ended up winning the next day, uh, driving home. And so my phone started blowing up. I had uh, four or five different producers call me, trying to make a movie, trying to make a book. And I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm a small town Saginaw kid from Michigan and, and I didn't know what, you know, what to do. So I uh, ended up, you know, signing with a, with a producer and, you know, went for a couple of years and then signed with somebody else, went a couple of years, signed with somebody else. And the whole town was supposed to be a movie. And, uh, you know, really, it never got any real traction. Um, John Linklater was going to make a movie of it with, uh, with um, who's going to be, Jack Black was going to be me. So I met oh. Jack Black uh, like five, five years ago. He came to Indy while I was out there bowling and, uh, you know, hung out him for a couple of days. And then, you know, we got close to making it be in a movie and it didn't. So uh, about, I don't know, 15 months ago, um, Brian Dushy James came to me. Okay. And said, would you like to be uh, my first project? And, you know, he's from Saginaw and uh, he was going from being an actor to being a producer. And uh, yeah, he turned it into uh, something and turned it into a sitcom. So uh, yeah, forever is supposed to be a movie. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things you, it's just your life. You don't, yeah. like, I'm just grinding through it. That's my thoughts of it. And, uh, you know, suddenly you're on TV on Thursday nights and it's, it, it's, it's, still unbelievable to me and I it, I'm waiting for it to stop or wake up at any point in time here <laughs> oh wow well how did you you know I know uh that you watched you know you went to watch your parents say so you bowled on a Sunday night mixed league uh and you used to go watch them is that kind of where your passion for bowling started or tell us how you really became so passionate about the sport um no, I mean, I just went with them. I was, I was really, really young. I didn't really bowl much at all then. Uh, it's my early teens. I, I never, you know, I played baseball when I was a kid. And that's kind mm -hmm. of my I play baseball all the time. But I live in Michigan, so you don't play baseball year round. So I ended up play, uh, bowling, joining a league when I was probably 12 or 13 years old um, with my cousin. You know, I used to do it hard, and, hard as I could down the middle of the lane and really didn't, didn't really care. Just it was something to do in the wintertime. And then, uh, I don't know, probably not until like 15 or 16 where I really like started, like I'm a super competitive person. So I couldn't be bad forever or I'd have to quit. And uh, so I started getting a little better, a little better. And um, it's kind of what happened. And, and then my late teens, I was fairly competitive, um, still wasn't very good. And then I was probably 20 years old, went to Vegas, pulled a, some big tournament out there. Mm -hmm. And I was, wasn't even very good then. And uh, made like 15,000 my first three or four hours I was there bowling and uh, it kind of hooked me being like a uh -huh. suddenly you just made twenty thousand dollars in a, in a day and a half and uh that, that's what kind of hooked me and got me into bowling uh you know you know when you're that that age you're making that kind of money and yeah and, and yeah, you're having fun doing it right doing something you love to do so yeah then it was fun and I, you know I started working and, and did it on the side all the time and it's kind of what happened. Oh, that, yeah, that's when you can do something uh, and make money, but you're enjoying yourself, that, that really is, that's the way to go. And, and so is that really when you decided, hey, I, I really would like to pursue this full time. I would like to become a professional bowler. Yeah, I, I thought that then. And then I watched how good the guys were that were professional bowlers. And I was like, no chance of me ever doing that. And uh, so in 03, I, it was, I decided, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna give my one shot, no three, oh, four, um, is a year before the exam tour. So if you made the top 15 points, you're exempt for the following year, you can bowl every event, you get paid every week, no matter where you can, where you ended up in, in points or in a tournament uh -huh. you get paid every week. And, uh, I think I finished 53rd. So I just missed that. So then I'm like, you know what? I kind of took my tail and said, you know, I, I gave it a run. I tried, I'm sure. gonna go home. But work, you know, I'll do, I'll, I'll bowl a little on the side. I always have, but I'll just go back home and go to work. And, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what I did in 04. So, um, you know, I gave it my chance and make it and I was okay with it. At least I tried. And, uh, you know, went back, came home, we went to work and then, and then OA happened and got laid off. I'm like, it, you know, it couldn't have been any better timing the way it was. Uh, the tournament that was for us to, to make the, make the tour was in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So two hours from my house, a place I bowled 
hundreds of times in my life. And, uh, you know, when I got laid off, I assumed I'd back to work in the next month or two months. So sure. no panic. As did a lot of other people that, that, that went through the same thing. Correct. Correct. So um, layoffs just happen. You're off for a month or two, maybe three or four, but you get called back and you go back to work. No big deal. And uh, so, you know, as soon as I got laid off, it was December. There was a big tournament in Vegas. I called my old sponsor up and said, hey, do you, uh, do you mind? Do you want me to go bowl? You put me in? He's like, yeah, of course. So I went there and made some decent money there. And, and, you know, didn't get called back, didn't get called back. And then tour trials was getting closer and closer. And I kind of just told my wife, I'm like, hey, if I'm not called back by then, I'm going to, I'm going to bowl tour trials. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's some. And I, have, I, I have to ask, what was her yeah. reaction? There was some definitely some hesitation. Um, she knew I was a good bowler. I've always been a pretty good uh, bowler. Uh, but, you know, you're laid off. I'm not, I'm not making a ton of money. And uh, to put up a couple thousand dollars for you to go bowl a tournament, if you're not in the top five, you get zero dollars back. And, you know, now what? So uh, closer and closer we got, you know, I, I, we just we decided we're going to do it. Um, she was on board. Um, and generally always had a sponsor to pay for my stuff. And I got a percentage of the winnings. Because, you know, when you went to Vegas, it cost you $20,000. I just didn't have $20,000 to spend. So I always had a sponsor. And, and, and that event, uh, I'm like, all right, we have to spend put our own money up because if I make it we can't afford to split it with anybody this is my yeah total. so uh yeah fortunate enough I finished third that week and I think that was the the, the tournament the more mo the most emotion I've ever had in a tournament in my life and it wasn't even winning it was just making a career to support my family absolutely so, yeah so absolutely but you know you know, there was uh, there was a line in last week's show that just I hung on to, uh, and it was the scene where your mom was letting your mom your mom was letting you know that she had gotten an interview for you and pretty much it was a shoe in for a job, and 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 Tom said maybe that's our problem. I'm talking about a chance every once in a while for a, I'm talking about taking a chance every once in a while for a better life. Um, and, you know, that really got me thinking that there's so many people that would really like to take that chance. They do see a future, but they're afraid to take that step. Um, and, you know, you were willing to give it that shot. And like you said, everything kind of lined up, everything played into it. Uh, the timing was good. Uh, it was unfortunate that you got laid off, but you know, this kind of gave you that little push to go on and do what you've been wanting to do and devote yourself to it. Um, and so I, I thought that was a really good line uh, and, and I'm definitely going to remember that, you know, if, if, and we were talking about this before the show, um, there are a few good things that happened as a result of COVID. And one of them is I think that it made people realize to not wait for tomorrow. Don't just put things off and put things off. If there's something you want to do, you need to do it now. Uh, and you are a living example of that. Um, so hats off for you to have the courage to do that. Um, I think it's remarkable. Um, so, so I want to ask you, um, well, you know, just off the wall here. Uh, yeah. I know that Archie's Lanes is noted for curly fries. That was the, the thing. So I know that when you got laid off that you spent a lot of time in a bowling center. Uh, first of all, was curly fries their calling card? No, not really. No. <laughs> Okay, so that's part of the show, right? Right. <laughs> but, but let's talk a little bit about that because you were given an opportunity as a young man um, that the center allowed you to come in during your off time and your, your um, time where you had just more time on your hands than you needed to come in and practice. And that was extremely valuable to you. Talk a little bit about that and how beneficial that was in in your career yeah that started everything um is any any sport you play if you don't practice you're no good it just 
if you don't practice, you only get so far. And uh, Stephen Ann Doyle owned the bowling center that's only a few miles from my house, um, state lanes, and, and uh, they allowed me to come in and practice whenever I wanted to. Um, they put patterns out for me. Um, they were uh, got sent to me because of without them, I really can afford to, to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars each week to practice when I wasn't making that much money. So I was laid off. So um, he just kind of took care of me. And uh, so it was, uh, it was awesome. They, they, they were, they were like family to me. And uh, um, it just, they took care of me for a few years there that, you know, I, I couldn't afford to practice there. I couldn't have, I couldn't. Absolutely. I couldn't, so we could pay for it. And they just kind of took care of me out of, and, and really when I first started going there, I was just a stranger to them. They really didn't know me besides seeing the league every once in a while, but that was it. So uh, yeah, people had faith in me and, and uh, it, they, they were, they were amazing to me. You know, it's, it's funny that that's not uncommon. You know, uh, bowling centers are so family oriented. They, um, you know, I was in a bowling center for 20 years and, and I saw a lot of young people that came through our center many of which were hired, you know, but there were a lot that just hung out there because that was their, that was their, their feel good place. Um, but what centers sometimes maybe don't realize is the impact that they themselves as owners and operators in a center, the impact that they have on some of these young lives and how something as simple as allowing you to, to practice when the lanes were open and not you know, just sitting there, not doing anybody, uh, bringing in any revenue, they took that and gave that opportunity to you, uh, as do a lot of centers do. They do, you know, that's one of the neat things about being in bowling. It, it first of all, when you get that passion, it, you, you can't get rid of it. And I think you are a living example of that. You get that desire, you, you love the sport, it gets infested in you and there's just, there's no looking back. Maybe it's not what any of us set out to do was, you know, to, to be involved in this, this world, but that's where we landed and that's where our passion lies now. Um, but I think sometimes as owners and operators of uh, bowling centers, we don't really realize the impacts that we can have on other people's lives, be it someone coming in, like yourself to practice to fulfill their dream of becoming a professional bowler or be it molding an employee a young employee that maybe this was their first job and they knew nothing about you know work ethics or hard work for that matter and we all know that working in a bowling center is definitely hard work but there there are so many lives that are affected by things that go on in a bowling center uh, and and I think it's really nice to see um, how it affected you and how what an important part that was in your journey of becoming a professional bowler. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that everything hasn't just been, you know, perfect, um, but we have several people that we have a young man um, uh, that was on our show uh, not too long ago and he's 12 years old and he has a dream of becoming a professional bowler. Um, Easton is his name. Easton, if you're watching us today, this is going to be you one day, Easton. Tom is living proof that those dreams that you have right now as a 12 year old can come true, right, Tom? Absolutely, absolutely. Practice, practice, practice and make those fairs. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, and, and the other thing I want to mention is I asked you about the curly fries. It's funny because, you know, as you uh, as you bowl at, at different venues and stuff, there's always something at that venue that, you you know, that's like their, as I said earlier, their calling card. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm sure that everybody out there watching realizes, hey, do you know what your calling card is? What's your food that everybody, when they come to your center says, I got to have that burger, or I got to have that pizza. Uh, just know that that's out there. People actually do do that. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so, so Tom, let, well, first of all, I got to ask you this. Last week when you watched the show, um, 
your kids, I'm assuming were with you, is that correct? Yes. What was their reaction? Um, they're pretty laid back with me. Um, you know, I mean, my son wasn't born then, my I had a daughter was two. Uh, uh -huh. when I was. So, you know, and, and on a show, obviously I have a, I have a son that's probably 10-ish, which is my son's age now. And uh -huh. uh, like they're really not in it, but uh, yeah, they they liked it. They were, they laughed at it too. And they, they thought, <laughs> it was, but uh, yeah, they, I mean, it was, it was entertaining and we, we all loved it. Oh, that's right. Well, I can't wait. Folks, it's on tonight, 9.30 Eastern time. I can't wait for episode two. I did try to go in and see if I could get some sort of sneak peek. I got a teeny tiny sneak peek, told me nothing. So I have to wait till 9.30 tonight, Eastern time to be able to see what the next episode brings. But I'm certain that it's going to have me laughing just like the last episode did. So, but more so, Tom, the reason I wanted to have you on the show today is because when we started Beyond the Frame at the beginning of the pandemic, there were so many centers that were closing down and they weren't sure if they were going to be able to open back up. Uh, there were people that were going to the hospital or their loved ones were going to the hospital. And we were trying to find those messages of hope uh, of people that were doing great things for other people. Uh, and the, the, the one thing that I think is so outstanding with you is that you had a desire you had a dream and you took a chance on yourself to fulfill that dream and it came true for you. And you're no different than anybody else. The same thing that has happened to you can happen to other people. And I, before the show, I had mentioned, you know, we have centers that made it through the pandemic and other centers didn't and they've closed their doors. And we've got people that are possibly saying, you know, I really would like to have two or three centers. That's my dream, but I just don't think that I can do that. There's no better time than now, right, Tom? Absolutely not. Yeah, there's, this is, I mean, uh, all the centers around here are doing great now. Everyone that survived is doing amazing. And, and I mean, no time to buy a center, better, no better time <laughs> to buy Because, uh, yeah, I mean, bowling centers are I'll back. pursue a career in a PBA for that oh, matter. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, no, it's uh, it's great. Absolutely. Well, Tom, um, I certainly do appreciate you being on the show with us today. Um, I am thrilled that you have been the one that has moved bowling to prime time. Um, I will have to admit, I laugh at you a lot. Uh, don't take it personally, but okay. it's a great show. Uh, and, and I think that it's uh, a great story more so than anything else. And so I'm, I'm just so happy. This was our first time to meet. Uh, and I'm very thrilled to uh, have this opportunity to sit down and talk with you a little bit. Um, so uh, it is there anything that you would like to leave our viewers with? Not really. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty laid back and uh, I don't have all that to say very often. Okay. All right. Well, uh, guys, if y'all uh, are available tonight eight, at 9.30 Eastern time, make sure that you watch episode two. If you haven't seen episode one, go find it, watch it. It's worth it. It sets the stage. Um, and viewers, I want to also mention that on April the 25th, uh, that is a Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we are going to have a guest, uh, Ray Kowalski, He's a double above the knee amputee. He's missing digits on both hands and he's um, hard of hearing. He is going to be our guest on the show uh, to talk to us a little bit. He's a bowler. He has explored many other sports, including wrestling. He's just got a phenomenal never give up attitude. Uh, and he's going to be our guest on the show on uh, Tuesday, April the 25th at three o'clock. So make sure you mark your calendars and plan to tune in on that. And before we go, um, Tom, I am going to quote a line that Pete said last week in the show that I think uh, whether it's your words or his words, uh, the writer's words, I thought it was pretty good. But um, according to uh, him, this was, this was your uh, message and it said when life kicks you in the ass you gotta hang in there 
because sometimes the worst day of your life ends up being the best thing that could have happened. I think you are a living example of that. So thank you for what you do for this sport, for this industry, uh, and for giving us a few laughs during prime time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for being my guest today. Viewers, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I was not able to go uh, get the questions off of the live feed today. But uh, if you have any questions, um, Tom has agreed that he would try to answer them. Uh, so leave us a message on this. If you go back and view it later and you have a question for Tom or myself, make sure you let us know and we'll be happy to answer that. Uh, best of luck. I can't wait to see episode two tonight at 930 Eastern. Thanks again, Tom, for being our guest. Thank you. Mm -hmm.